The Blind Assassin by Laura Chase, Ringgold James and Morrow, New York, 1947. Prologue. Perennials for the rock garden. She has a single photograph of him. She tucked it into a brown envelope on which she had written clippings and hid the envelope between pages of perennials for the rock garden where no one else would ever look. She has preserved this photo carefully because it's almost all she has left of him. It's black and white, taken by one of those boxy, cumbersome flash cameras from before the war, with their accordion plate nozzles and their well-made leather cases that looked like muscles with straps and intricate buckles. The photo is of the two of them together, her and his this man, on the picnic. Picnic is written on the back, in pencil, not his name or hers, just picnic. She knows the names, she doesn't need to write them down. They are sitting under a tree. It might have been an apple tree. She didn't notice the tree much at the time. She, she's, she's wearing a white blouse with the sleeves rolled to the elbow and white skirt tucked around her knees. There must have been a breeze because of the way the shirt is blowing up against her. Or perhaps it was not blowing. Perhaps it was clinging. Perhaps it was hot. It was hot. Holding her hand over the picture, she can still feel the heat coming up from it, like the heat from the sun warmed stone at midnight. The man is wearing a light-colored hat angled down on his head and partially shading his face. His face appears to be more darkly tanned than hers. She has turned half towards him and smiling in a way she can't remember smiling at anyone since. She seems very young in the picture, too young. Too young though she had not considered herself too young at that time. He's smiling too. The whiteness of his teeth shows up like a scratched mass flaring, but he's holding up his hand as if to fend her off in play or else to protect himself from the camera. From the person who must be there taking the picture or else to protect himself from those in the future who might be looking at him, who might be looking at him through this square lighted window of glazed paper as if to protect himself from her, as if to protect her in this outstretched protecting hand, there is this tub and of a cigarette. She retrieves the brown envelope when she is alone and slides the photo out from the, from among the newspaper clippings. She lays it flat on the table and stirs down into it as if she's peering into a well or pool, searching beyond her own reflections for something else, something she must, she must have dropped or lost out of the reach but still visible, shimmering like a jewel on stand. Jewel on sand. She examines every detail. His fingers bleached by flash or the sun's glare. The folds of their clothing, leaves of the tree, and the small brown shapes hanging there were the apples after all. The coarse grass in the fur foreground, the grass. The grass was yellow. Yellow than because the weather had been dry. Over to one side, you won't see it at all. First, there is a hand cut by the margin, scissored off, scissored off at the wrist, resting on the grass as if discarded. Left to its own devices, the trace of blown cloud in the brilliant sky like ice cream smudge toned chrome. His smoke stained fingers, the distant glint of the water, all drowned now, drowned, but shining. The blind says in the hard boiled egg, what will it be then? He says, dinner, dinner jackets and romance or shipwrecks on a barren coast. Or sh shipwrecks on a barren coast? You can have your pick, jungles, tropical islands, mountains or another dimension of space. That's what, that's what I'm best at. Another dimension of space? Oh, really? Don't scoff. It's useful address. Anything you like can happen there. 
spaceships and skin tight uniforms, ray guns, Martians with the bodies of giants, squids, that sort of thing. You choose, she says. You are the professional. How about a desert? I've always wanted to visit one. With an oasis, of course. Some date palms might be nice. She's stirring the crust of her sandwich. She does not like the crusts. Not much hope. Not much scope. White deserts. Not many features, unless you add some tombs. Then you could have a pack of nude women who have been dead for 3,000 years with late, gracious figures rubby right. Lips is your hair in form of tumbled curls and eyes like snake filled pits, but I don't think I could fob those off on you. Leer it. Isn't your style? You never know. I might like them. I doubt it. They are for the huddled messes. Popular on the covers, though they will with ever a fellow, they have to be beaten off with the rifle rifle butts. Could have could I have another dimension of space? And also of the tombs and the dead women, please? That's tall order. That's tall order. But I'll see what I can do. I could throw in some sir sacrificial virgins as well with metal breastplates and silver ankle chains, diaphanous vestments, and a pack of ravening wolves extra. I can see you will stop at nothing. You want the dinner jackets instead. You want the dinner jackets instead. Cruise ships, white laden, waist kissing and hypocritical slop. No, all right. Do what you think is best, Sigrid. She shakes her head for no. Her light has own striking the match on his thumbnail. You'll set fire to yourself, she says. I never have yet. She looked at his rolled up short sleeve, white or pale blue, than his waist and browner skin of his hand. He throws out radiance, it must be reflected, son. Why isn't everyone staring? Still, he is too noticeable to be out there, out in the open. There are other people around sitting on the grass or lying on it, propped on one elbow, other picnickers in their pale summer clothing. It's all very proper, nevertheless. She feels that the two of them are alone. As if apple tree they are resitting under is not a tree but a tent, as if there is a line drawn around them with chalk. Instead, this line they are invisible. Space. Space it is. Then he says, With tombs and virgins and wills, but on the installment plan. Agreed? Agreed. The installment plan. The installment plan, you know? Like furniture, she laughs. No, I'm serious, you can't scamp it. It might take days. We'll have to meet again. She has a date, it's all right. She says, if I can, I can. If I can, if I can arrange it. Good, good, he says. Now I have to think. He keeps his voice casual. Too much urgency might put her off. On the planet of, let's see, not Saturn, it's too close. On planet Zychron, located in another dimension of space, there's a rubble strewn plain. To the north is the ocean, which is violet in color. To the west is the range of mountains, said to be roamed after the sunset by the voracious and that female inhabitants then of the crumbling tombs located there. You see, I have put the tombs in right of the bat. That's very conscientious of you, she says. I stick to my bargains. To the south, it's the burning waste of sand. And to the east are the several steep valleys that might once have been rivers. I suppose there are canals like Mars. Oh, canals and all sort of things. Abundant traces of an ancient and once highly developed civilizations through this region is now only sparsely inhabited by roaming bands of emitting nomads. In the middle of plain is a large mound of stones, the land around it is arid, with a few scrappy bushes, not exactly a desert, but close enough. Is there a cheese sandwich left? She rummages in the paper bag, no, she says. But it's a hard-boiled act. She's never been this happy before. 
Everything is fresh again, still to be enacted. Just what the doctor ordered, he says. A bottle of lemonade, hard boiled egg, and thou. He rolls the egg between his palms, cracking the shell, then peeling it away. She watches his mouth, the jaw, of the teeth, besides me, beside me, singing. In public park, she says, here is a salt for it. Thanks, you remembered everything. This area plant isn't claimed by any one. He continues, or rather it's claimed the five different tribes. None strong enough to inhalate the others. All of them went or past the stone heap from time to time, hurting their thugs. Blue sheep like creatures with vicious tempers and transporting merchandise of little value on their pack animals in a sort of three eyed camp. The pile of stones is called in their various languages the haunt of flying snakes, the heap of rubble, the abode of howling mothers, the door of oblivion, and the pit of gnawed bones. Each tribe tells a similar story about it. Underneath the rocks, they say a king is buried. A king without a name. Not only the king, but the remains of the magnificent city this king once ruled. The city was destroyed in the battle and the king was captured and hanged from the date farm as a sign of triumph. At moonrise, he was cut down and buried and the stones were piled up to mark the spot. As for the other inhabitants of the city, they were all killed, butchered men, butchered men women, children, babies, even the animals put to sword. Hacked to the pieces. No living thing was spared. That terrible stick a shovel. And the ground almost anywhere. And some horrible thing or other will come to light. Good for the trade. We thrive on bones. Without them, there, there would be no stories. Any more lemonade? No, she says. We have drunk it all up. Go on. The real name of the city was erased from memory by conquerors. And this is why say the tale tellers the place is now known only by the name of its own destruction the pile of stones thus marks both an act of deliberate remembrance and an act of deliberate forgetting they are fond of paradox in that region each of the five tribes claims to have been victorious attackers each recalls a slaughter with relish each believes it was ordained by their own god as righteous vengeance vengeance because of this unholy pra- because of the unholy practice carried on the carried on in the city. Ill must be cleansed with blood, they say. On that day, blood rained like water, so afterwards it must have been very clean. Every head horseman or merchant who passed horseman or merchant who passes adds a stone to the heap. It's an old custom you do in it in remembrance of that of your own dad. But since no one knows who the dead under the pile of stones really were, they all leave their stones on the off chance. They all get around it by telling you that what happened there must have been the will of their god, and thus by leaving a stone, they are honoring the, this will. There is also a story that claims the city was not really destroyed at all. Instead, through a charm known only to the king, the city and its inhabitants were whisked away so replaced by phantoms of themselves and it was only these phantoms and it was only these phantoms that were burned and slaughtered the real city was shrunk very small and placed in a cave beneath the great heap of stones everything that was once there is there still including the palaces and the gardens filled with the trees and flowers including the people no bigger than ants but going about their lives as before wearing their tiny clothes, giving their tiny banquets, telling their tiny stories, singing their tiny songs. The king knows that what's happened and it gives him nightmares. But the rest of them don't know. They don't know they are, they have become so small. They don't know they are supposed to be dead. They don't even know they have been saved. To them, the ceiling a frog looks like a sky light comes in through the pinhole between the stones and they think it's a sun to the leaves the leaves of the apple tree rustle she looks up at the sky then her watch i'm cold she says i'm so i'm also late could you dispose of the evidence she gathers i she gathers eggshells twists up wax paper no hurry say surely no hurry surely it's not cold here. There is a breeze coming through from the water. She says the wind must have been changed. She leans forward, moving to stand up. Don't go yet. 
he says too quickly. I have to. They'll be looking for me if I'm overdue. They'll want to know where I have been. She smooths her skirt down, wraps her arms around herself, turns away the small green apples, watching her like ice.